Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone is doing fantastic today. Uh, if you're with us over the weekend, some of us are still recuperating from a very long Saturday where we recorded a video production shoot uh, documenting Masonic dining. And we hope to have something enjoyable for you to watch and see before the end of the year for those that participated with us in that event. Um, I assumed you iced your feet well, as did I, and uh, hopefully you recovered nicely. With that being said, brothers and friends, welcome. This is episode seven of our 12 part series this year, which is conversations, 21st century conversations on Freemasonry. For those of you who are returning visitors to our education, we welcome you and thank you for coming back. And for those of you who are new, thank you for being with us this evening. First, I would like to begin by recognizing the Masonic sponsors who help and participate to conduct these virtual Masonic education series. William Aware Lodge of Research is dedicated to helping brothers pursue further light in masonry. It was chartered in 1965. It is Kentucky's oldest research lodge. The lodge was named after the most worshipful brother, William Aware, who served as Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Kentucky in his 1957-58 term. Lexington Lodge No. 1 was chartered in 1788 and is the oldest Masonic Lodge in Kentucky. The Lodge has historic membership, which includes senators, congressmen, governors, and mayors. Lexington Lodge No. 1 strives daily to create and deliver a heritage observance culture that is reminiscent of Freemasonry in the past. And the Rubicon Masonic Society is an imitation-only private group of Master Mason Freemasons located in Lexington, Kentucky. The purpose of the Rubicon Masonic Society is to establish a deeper understanding and connection with Freemasonry, with its traditions and practices, and further cementing the brotherhood of its members and guests outside of the lodge, primarily through education. Alongside my uh, good friends and fellow worship brothers, Dan Kimball, past master of William O'Ware Lodge of Research and recorder of Rubicon, worship brother John Bizak, past master of Lexington Lodge Number 1 and vice chairman of Rubicon, Brothers, my name is Brian Evans. I'm the past and current master of Lexington Lodge Number no. 1 and chairman of the Rubicon Masonic Society. And again, I'm humbled and I thank you for joining us this evening. Worshipful Brother Kimball, would you mind, sir, to do the honors this evening in, in lieu of Tom Nitsky's absence to deliver the opening devotion? I'd be happy to, Worshipful Brother Brian. Brothers, uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Grand Architect of the Universe, we pray your blessings on us this evening. And we give you thanks for the opportunity that we have to share this time of fellowship and Masonic education. And we pray that you would simply bless the time that we share together. And we ask that you would be with us uh, as we explore Freemasonry this evening, lead our discussion, lead our conversations, and make this an evening that would be pleasing to you. We ask all this in your holy name. Amen. So noted be. Thanks, Worship Brother. Uh, brothers and friends, the purpose of this virtual Masonic education, for those of you that have attended already know, but for those of you who are new, is to assist in the improvement of oneself by establishing a deeper understanding of Freemasonry, of its traditions and practices, and further cementing the brotherhood of the fraternity for the betterment of mankind. Any opinions expressed during this virtual education will be those of the presenter or participant and do not necessarily reflect the views of any lodge or grand lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. By participating with us this evening, you can send to our guidelines of our and our full disclosure can be seen at RubiconMasonicSociety.com slash disclaimer. As you know, these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are welcome to attend and participate. Therefore, please, everyone, be mindful that anything discussed this evening should be suitable for Masons of all degrees, as well as non-Masons. Gentlemanly manners are to be expected at all times. We request no alcohol, no smoking, food, or foul language during this presentation. There will also be no discussion of politics or religion at any time, and attendees may be removed if not following protocol. In an effort to best assure that this virtual meeting is as enjoyable as possible, we do have a few recommendations for you. First, our recommended attire for each of our meetings is coat and tie. Please type your name and any appropriate Masonic title or location under your video to identify yourself to others. If you're not a Mason, please simply type guest after your name. Please enable your video camera so other attendees can see you. 
Please reduce background noise and keep your microphone muted when not speaking. Please turn off all other computer programs to eliminate outside distractions. And finally, please be patient should any te technical difficulties occur. Brothers and friends, tonight's presentation is a unique one. It's one that is often enjoyed by many Freemasons and also often misunderstood by many in the outside world. And tonight our present presenter will be Warsaw brother Barry Easton. He will be talking about esoteric Freemasonry, the lurking shadow in the back of the lodge room. For proper introduction, I will pass the microphone over to Worship Brother John Bizak to introduce our speaker this evening. Worship Brother Bizak. Thank you, Brother. Worshipful Brother Barry Easton, past master of Green Up Lodge 89 in northeastern Kentucky. He's a 33rd degree and a recipient of the Knight York Cross of Honor in the York Rite. Brother Barry belongs to several Masonic and non-Masonic orders that are considered overtly esoteric. And he's made a life study of the esoteric aspect of Freemasonry, which has introduced and led him to what he says may have been many other curious and interesting byways and stops along the way. He's also a member of the Rubicon Masonic Society. Worshipful brother, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, is my audio coming through okay? Yes, it is, sir. All right. Do uh, you want me to uh, do the screen share thing here? Yes, in just a moment, let me stop share. I'll make you co-host and we should be all set to rock. There you go. All right, is that showing up okay? I'm not seeing your screen on my end. Is anyone else? No, Brother Barry, we're not seeing it on your end. Perhaps you're trying to share a different monitor if you're using two? No, I've only got one. Um, let's try the PowerPoint then. There we go. There we go. We see your screen now. Better? All set. Perfect. All right. So the title of this talk this evening was uh, Esoteric Freemasonry, the Lurking Shadow in the Back of the Lodge Room what it is, why it is, and how it integrates into the structure of the craft. And for anybody in here who, who has the same interest that I do, don't worry, there's no explosive uh, scandalous secrets gonna be given out. Uh, I'm not even gonna go too deep into any of the various subjects that comprise this, just to give a very broad scope, bird's eye view, of how this all fits together uh, within the craft and what some of the uh, principles that people deem are esoteric masonry, you know, in fact are. So Freemasonry, since its inception, has done many different things for many different people. Over the hundreds of years of our existence, we have had as our patrons statesmen, presidents, kings, scientists, athletes, actors, musicians, laborers, and other professions from all over the spectrum. The common point that is Freemasonry is what has brought us together in the Lodge Hall belief in the brotherhood of man under the all-seeing eye of God, or quaintly put, a peculiar system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols, a definition I'm sure many of us have heard hundreds of times. The most mostly social, philanthropic, and fraternal aspect of the craft is what most are familiar with practicing. However, there exists another face to our royal art that is probably known about as, at least as much as this, but much more widely misunderstood and quite frankly maligned, not only by the profane, but among members of the fraternity as well. This face is known in most circles as esoteric Freemasonry. As with most papers or talks on any given subject, we should probably start with a definition pulled directly off the almighty internet of what the word esoteric means. Esoteric is an adjective. And the definition is that it's intended for or likely to be understood only by a small number of people with a specialized knowledge or interest. Having said this, I will give the customary disclaimers to any and all talks and papers that I ever give on the craft in a very short fashion. Anything said in this talk is my view, mine alone, as far as this talk goes. And the views expressed by the writer are in no way endorsed by any Grand Lodge or Lodge even if the individual brothers of a lodge or even the majority of a lodge would agree with them, 
The craft as a whole cannot and will not officially endorse them, nor should they. I also openly and honestly state that these views are mine at this time, and I reserve the right to change my mind in any way I see fit at any future point. Now, moving forward, I will address the title of this talk. Now, what is esoteric Freemasonry? To start with, I will attempt to make a very long story very short. For if we take the above definition, all of Freemasonry is esoteric. And to me, it doesn't matter if anyone views it this way or not. The very second that somebody took the working tools of the operative Masons and made them into a speculative object for meditation, intellectual, and or spiritual analogies, the corollary would be that this would require the specialized knowledge that this act had in fact been done, i.e. the knowledge that these are not meant to be taken and understood in their mundane and temporal terms, but in a spiritual view. The parables of the Bible are a good analogy for this. This specialized knowledge and interest is what makes us look at the square and compass in a very different fashion than the uninitiated. Take someone who knows nothing of Freemasonry and show them this symbol. What would, it, what would they say that it means to them? But take it and show it to a brother or an initiate. And he immediately would begin to evoke thoughts and feelings of morality, brotherhood, integrity, honor, just to name a few. Understanding that this is an open forum with brothers of lower degrees and possibly even the uninitiated present, I won't, will not go into the specifics of our symbolism and ritual. All I can do is ask this, can you think of one element of our craft that does not scream that it is esoteric? The apparent and seemingly odd nature and practices of all the degrees in the Blue Lodge, and I won't even begin to touch the high degrees, especially the Master Mason degree, should alone prove this. So to state it in its most simple terms, in my view, there is no such thing as esoteric Freemasonry. To me, it is all esoteric. And some people choose to acknowledge and pursue that, and some do not. Frankly, it just depends on how far down the rabbit hole you're willing to go. The reality between the practical application of the craft and this statement or view, however, is quite different. So I must now speak as if my statement is not accurate or that esoteric Freemasonry is an external and separate viewpoint of its own, which is tied in some way to the views of our members of the craft, which itself is merely a fraternal organization with odd symbols and practices for the remainder and nothing more than that. It's just a brotherhood. So there, as I said, are many types of men involved in the craft. Some come for the friendship, camaraderie, some for the philanthropic aspect, and yes, some come for the spiritual aspect. Yet even among the latter group, there are subdivisions. There's a term used among more than a few brothers called town hall masonry. This term is to some brothers analogous to what Pike referred to as the masonry of the multitudes. It is, of course, used in a derogatory manner by many, but when I use the phrase here tonight, I do not mean any disrespect at all. It may sound as if I do, in fact, but I do not mean any disrespect. I simply have not been able to come up with a better phrase to define what I see as the more common and much more informal practice of Freemasonry in the vast majority of areas in our country. Now, this does not, this does have a tie with esoteric Freemasonry because as some men are content with the shorts and flip-flops and bologna sandwich on a paper plate approach to the Masonic experience, if you can call it that, some are not. All have partaken from the well of Freemasonry or esoteric Freemasonry, but will not or in many cases cannot acknowledge it. Thus, the Freemasonry of the multitudes or town hall masonry has developed, or as will be shown, has probably always been here. This is no new phenomenon. As a short digression, I would like to point out that I have in the past disagreed with the phrase Masonic Restoration Movement, because I think that for the most part, we pine for a golden age and time that in this country, at least, I'm not sure that it ever existed, not on a large scale. I have several good and close friends who disagree with me on this, and that's, that's fine. I do think Freemasonry was more formal in decades past, but not to the extent that you would get, for example, from Lexington number one or Abraham number eight, who I will tip my hat to. Uh, they're just starting their own movement in Louisville as well. These being the only two that I know of in our state that are pursuing this on a large and active scale. The things that esoteric Masons and Masons 
and the restoration and TO movements complain about and want to change have been going on for at least 100 years or more in this country. I'd like to quote Albert Pike from his liturgy of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite for degrees four through 14. This is a short uh, little quote of a couple paragraphs that Albert Pike wrote. It is an allegory, of course, but is an allegory intended to teach a lesson based on, you know, obviously what he and many Masons saw going on. This is about the perfect ALU of the 14th degree attempting to protect the temple of Freemasonry from the masses. They, the perfect ALUs, were extremely careful as to the admission of new members into the Masonic order, making merit alone the test of qualification. And the grand elect, perfect and sublime Masons especially received no one until after a long probation and by many trials, he had been proven worthy. Upon completion of the temple, many Masons of the inferior degrees and some of the grand elect, perfect and sublime Masons journeyed into other countries. Still more followed them after the excesses of the king became insufferable. And in a few years, the Jewish architects and initiates were to be found in every part of the world. They admitted many into the order, made known to them its truths, and taught them its duties. For a long time, they were wisely cautious to admit none but proper persons who could appreciate the true purposes and objects of the royal craft. But by degrees, the inferior grades of masonry, the lesser mysteries, their teachings narrowed, and the symbols so interpreted as to suit the common comprehension. So spread abroad that men were indiscriminately admitted, almost without inquiry, and it was forgotten that masonry was not meant to be a popular, but a select and exclusive institution. Improper men gained admission. Unworthy persons even became blind teachers of the blind, trivialized the ceremonies and substituted commonplace absurdities for the profound lessons of wisdom of the ancient sages. It came to be no privilege, no mark of honor to be admitted to the lesser mysteries. Dissension divided the lodges, ambition entered into, in, in, ambition entered into the room and men coveting ranks and titles. The secrets were sold for money and the masonry of the multitudes fell into merited contempt. But the grand elect perfect and sublime masons long avoided and resisted these errors. They carefully concealed their secrets from the vulgar, kept strict watch at the doors of their temples and refused to multiply their initiates. They strove to arrest the downward progress of the fundamental degrees and refused any degree above that of master on those who conducted themselves viciously and unmasonically. But they could not forever close their doors against the innovations and irregularities. The mysteries continued to degenerate and the abuses proved both contagious and ep epidemic. Candidates were admitted in order to gain numbers or for revenue alone. The degrees were too rapidly conferred and without a knowledge of the principles or even of the work of the preceding degrees. On the part of the candidates, men of little intellect and information swarmed into the order and lowered it to their level. Others joined it through mere idle curiosity and wholly disregarded their obligations. Frivolous ceremonies were multiplied and new degrees invented and large bodies of men calling themselves Masons threw off their allegiance, pretended to a knowledge of the true word without possessing it and invented new rites, so that the temple of masonry became an arena of strife and a house of contention. It is the history of human folly and the occupation of the present always is to reenact the follies of the past. If the account is legendary only as to the Hebrew masonry, it is historical as to the mysteries all of which fell into decadence by inordinate multiplication of their initiates. End quote. Brothers, does any of this allegory sound familiar? This was written by one of the most prolific Masonic authors in our history in the mid to late 1800s. I would like to point out two things in particular. First, the emphasis that the symbols were so interpreted so as to suit the common comprehension. This will imply that there was a secret or specialized knowledge necessary to comprehend and interpret these symbols in a correct manner, thus esoteric. Second, that there existed in this allegory a more common element that pulled the craft down to its level. Before we leave this passage, however, ask yourself how many times have you noticed the same thing going on in the craft today? How many 
lost our portals that changed the craft rather than the craft changing them. How many times have you seen debris work devolve into a free for all of shouts, laughs, chatter? Have you ever heard the sound of a billy goat being mimicked in the lodge? I have no idea why that ever happens. If we wanna look for the answers to these problems, all we gotta do is look in the mirror. Now the use of the word mystery in the above quote carries much weight too. Utilization of this word in this context derives from the practice and content of the mystery religions of the ancient times. Mystery religions of the ancient world were characterized first and foremost by secrecy, the teachings being reserved for those who were initiates. They were characterized by teaching teachings of a societal, social, and divine nature marked by what was usually a mythos or theme of a dying and rising God used and employed in an initiation ritual. The teachings of the ancient and indeed the modern mystery schools have varied in form and have used different vehicles to deliver the message. Astrology, Kabbalah, Tarot, Theurgy, Alchemy have all been employed to achieve this end in spite of what many, that in spite of the fact that many brothers think these subjects have absolutely no association or place within the craft or its teachings. These particular subjects can make our craft operative for the practitioners and unknown to many of the rank and file brothers, there are operative masons within your midst. It is not so much a secret as it is a private practice for individuals interested in spiritual development. Few will ever admit or discuss such things in mixed company, even among masons, nor should they in casual conversation. Now what I say next is, is probably going to be controversial too. So if you're easily offended, turn your volume down or skip the paragraphs if you're reading this in printed form. We have painted ourselves into a corner with canned answers of what Freemasonry is and what it is not. And most public speakers on the subject are very quick and happy to point out that Freemasonry is not a religion. I do not believe that it is either, and I would like to make that clear up front. But on the other hand, there are many esoteric Masons that feel that the philosophical relationship to the ancient mysteries cannot be denied. Do we have a clear lineage to the mystery religions? No, we do not. But I cannot conceive that Freemasonry, as it has developed over the last few hundred years, is at least not a spiritual heir to this tradition. We do the exact same thing with our initiations, our morals, our ritual. The teachings and morals transcend and join all religions. The ritual and divine teachings do the same. And when read in their proper light, one can clearly say, see that they are not meant to be taken literally in a religious sense. It is not a religion, but it is indeed a philosophy. And this link between the mysteries of the ancient world and our modern craft or another line of definition of what esoteric Freemasonry is. Given our audience here tonight, we probably should not delve too much further into this. It is not proper to speak uh, in this form and we should, might become too specific. Now having defined Freemasonry with the aforementioned parameters to has told us what esoteric Freemasonry is. And the above story when read with 21st century glasses tells me in no uncertain terms why esoteric Freemasonry is. I feel that it has been here with our, since our birth. And thus, I call it the lurking shadow in the back of the lodge room. I feel that when the transmutation from operative to speculative craft was complete and the degrees were close to their current form, it was already here. Thus, I believe that esoteric Freemasonry was here first. To take these concepts, practices, and beliefs and massage them into a form that will fit within the structure of the craft is indeed a very tricky and touchy subject. Generally speaking, the deeper aspects mentioned earlier, such as Kabbalah, theurgy, alchemy, and the like, probably will not ever find a widely accepted slot within the craft or specifically the Blue Lodge teachings. As with the movement of observant masonry, it can and does exist in small pockets across our land, but not on a very large scale at all, as stated, because most men are simply not interested in plumbing to these depths. Freemasonry is indeed a gateway drug for many on this search for the deepest of searches, yet it is generally conceded that it must be tempered to fit the egregore of the particular lodge, which is always a cross section of the community in which it resides. This is where the craft itself has spawned 
more esoterically inclined bodies, sometimes in the form of rites, R-I-T-E-S. Now, please note that I do not view these systems as appended bodies because they are not. They are rites with a, with a successive system of degrees and teachings that are all related and have a thread which one can follow from the entered apprentice degree to the final degree, whatever that degree may be. Thus, if the majority of the brothers do not want to pursue the deep, dark depths of esoteric pursuits in a craft or blue lodge, it matters not because they exist elsewhere outside of the blue lodge. And for all involved, one should make note that even the most basic and fundamental principles of teaching within a craft degrees of masonry are more than enough to keep a man philosophizing for his entire life. But for those who want more, there is more. Now we touch briefly on what happens when a seeker wants to go even deeper. Where do they go if the above simply doesn't touch on their interests? Well, they go outside of the craft degrees, as I said. Freemasonry is the great granddaddy of all esoteric movements. None, be they Masonic or not, would exist in their present form without the influence of what we do. Everything from the ritual movements, the obligations, even the layout of the temple, a chapter or lodge or whatever the body is called is derived mostly from our pattern and prototype. So to answer the last section of the title of this paper, how does esoteric Freemasonry integrate into the structure of the craft? What follows here are some of the main outlets for those interests that are considered to be an actual recognized part of Freemasonry. Now, I would like to also point out that enumerating the many rites and degrees that fo focus on esoteric subjects that are, are indeed a part of the craft or recognized are beyond what can be done in this paper is this is not meant to be an exhaustive list of them. Here I would refer to the indispensable book Beyond the Craft by Keith Jackson for further info on regular Masonic rites that are heavily interested in esoteric subjects. However, I will list some of the most prominent here. For us in the state of Kentucky, the most obvious choice to follow the craft degrees for further enlightenment is the Royal Arts degree. This degree in most jurisdictions is considered, considered to be the completion and fulfillment of the Master Mason degree. Without it, you simply have not completed the story that was started in the Master Mason degree in our typical Preston Webb working. Though clouded just a bit with American additions and three prerequisite degrees, along with being tied inseparably with what we call the York Rite, which is actually the American Rite, it is still the summit of ancient craft masonry as we're working in Kentucky and most other grand jurisdictions that follow emulation style of work. Now this rite, and, and specifically the Royal Arts degree, is not to be discounted as it is pregnant with symbolism and meaning for all Freemasonry, all Freemasons who work in our style of ritual in our state. Now, one of the other most famous is of course the ancient and accepted Scottish rite. The Scottish Rite, or the Rose Qua, as the British call it, is a system of degrees from 1 to 33, which elaborate and amplify the teachings of the craft and add in the introduction of many esoteric subjects if one is willing to look for them embedded within teachings and rituals. The Scottish Rite, as it exists in the United States, States today, is for esoteric masons one of the most underutilized of the rites, and it has the most unrealized potential. This is a complete system with its own craft degrees, rarely work in this country, but which are the foundation for the entire right. Many members have commented that the focus on progressing too quickly through the degrees, coupled with the changes in the degrees themselves over the years, have added to this underutilization. Notwithstanding these things, many esoterically inclined Masons have availed themselves of this right and forced her to give up her secrets over the decades. There is a treasure trove of esoteric thought contained within this system. And I would also stress that the complete doctrine of this rite is well within the reach of all its members as it is contained within the first 32 degrees. The 33rd degree is indeed an honorary degree and it is an honor, but the lessons and teachings in the first 32 comprise the complete teaching of the rite or what Pike referred to as the holy doctrine. Historically, a prime competitor with the Scottish Rite was the Rite of Memphis Mizraim, which still exists today in many forms, most, but not all lines of which are unrecognized and considered irregular by most Grand Lodges. This system amplifies the Scottish Rite even further to a blistering 90 
95 or even 100 degrees, depending on the lineage. The SRIA or Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, Masonic Rosicrucian order, is the English counterpart to our SRICF or the Societas Rosicruciana and Civitatibus Federatus. It was born during the occult revival of Victorian England, which saw many such groups proliferate. It is interesting to point out here that it was a side body of craft masonry that has spawned its own offshoots in several other Rosicrucian groups, that the SRIA and SRICF have both been parents to several Rosicrucian orders, many of which are still in existence today. Rosicrucian thought is a subject in itself and as said is well outside of the scope of this paper. The original brotherhood of the Rose Cross is thought by many to be a philosophical construct or creation, but as it happens, life imitates art and a myriad of actual living Rosicrucian orders have been created in this current. And one of the oldest and most verifiable is the Rosicrucian order that is tied to Freemasonry. The Scottish Rites and Rosicrucian societies were truly a product of their time. And ever since the time of Chevalier Ramsey's oration, Masonic Rites and Degrees have sprung into life, which number into the thousands. For the most part, only the strong have survived. But again, some of the most interesting have thought it better to separate from the craft to enjoy a bit more liberty, free to pick and choose and allow whoever they want to associate with, want to associate with and follow whatever path they see fit. All of these groups were either founded by Freemasons or carry a heavy influence from the craft. One of the most famous or infamous, or infamous of which was the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Founded in London in 1888 by three high-ranking Masonic Rosicrucians, William Wim Westcott, William Woodman, and McGregor Mathers. This was born out of the SRIA and it developed quickly in its first years from a metaphysical system of teaching couched in Egyptian dress to a full-blown magical order that taught all the basics of ceremonial magic, tarot, and Kabbalah amongst its, among other subjects due to the genius of one of its founders, McGregor Mathers, who you see in the lower right corner. The jewel in its crown was the system of Enochian magic that was taught to its inner order members. The order had its own inner turmoil as all human institutions do, but a casual glance at a Google search will reveal that many modern day offshoots still exist and it has counted amongst its members many famous practitioners, A.E. Waite, prolific Masonic author who with Pamela Coleman Smith developed what is probably the most famous tarot deck in the world, the Rider Waite deck. It also counted amongst its members, William Butler Yeats, Irish poet, Florence Farr, actress, and everyone's famous, uh, favorite bad boy, Aleister Crowley. Uh, if you've read anything at all about uh, esoteric Freemasonry or any of those related subjects, you know who Aleister Crowley is. There have also long been rumors that even Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, was also a member. Another order that descended from the craft and found a life of its own is the Order of Martinists. This order has its genesis in a regular Masonic rite of the 1700s, known as the Alu Cohen, founded by Martinez de Pasquale. This rite was a practicing theurgical order recognized by the Grand Lodge of France and was in operation until shortly after the founder's death in 1774. His doctrine, however, survived him, and it still exists today in two places. Pasquale had two very active students. The first was Jean-Baptiste Willermose, who modified the rite of strict observance into what today is known as the Chevalier Bonfaisant de la City Saint, or Knights Beneficent of the Holy City. This is a recognized rite known by the acronym of CBCS in our country, which is still an honorary and invitational Templar order. It contains the doctrine of Pasquale's order set into a Masonic chivalric context without the theurgical practices. The second most active of his students was Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin, who by traditional accounts left the Cohen and all Masonic orders to propagate the spirit of Pasquale's teachings without the theurgical practice, which he deemed was too dangerous, far too dangerous. He opted for a more inward approach of contemplation and prayer known as the way of the heart. And after his death, this was formed and codified into an order known as the Order Martiniste or the Martinist Order in 1886 
by Augustin Chaboso and Gerard and Kos, who was known by the nomen mysticum of Pappas. The Martinist order and many offshoots are still active today and have been active in many countries, including the United States since the late 1800s, but on a much smaller and more private scale. I will refrain here from making a, a longer list of who's who in esoteric orders. Suffice it to say that these four alone, and from these four alone, dozens and dozens of other orders and lineages have spread up. Some survive, many have not. And these all came from the minds and the hearts of esoteric Freemasons. It is true that many of the spiritual orders prey on the wants and desires of a multitude of well-meaning men and women, much like the mediums and spiritists have done in the past. Some of these promise long lost spiritual secrets, contact with the deceased loved one, others an excuse to practice loose morals without spiritual consequences. Others are merely a place to achieve a physical or spiritual high, depending on the practices. Having said these things, we should not take part in the cancel culture practice of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. There are indeed true valuable spiritual orders that make no promises other than you will be forever tied to others who are seeking the same truths. There's no salvation offered, no nirvana, no health and wealth, simply a promise that you will have others labor with you to achieve the goal that you're searching for, and which in the case of mankind is the last great unknown. Many of these orders have in the past directed men both inward and outward. This is what esoteric Freemasonry does forcing us to look in the deep, dark recesses of our own psychological and spiritual makeup to identify ourselves and our own faults and how to correct them, to recognize the divine and what or who it is. Or perhaps in some cases, these orders can cause us to look towards religion rather than away from it, to remember that all are created in the image of the divine and that the best way to show our love of God is in the practice of loving our neighbor who is created in his image. So to sum it up, brothers, esoteric Freemasonry is simply Freemasonry. It is built on the principle of the indirect language of symbolism and allegory. One is allowed to go as far as he wants in the pursuit of it. Esoteric Freemasonry is astrology, astrology it's Kabbalah, it's alchemy, it's theurgy. It's all of these things, and it's none of these things. It can simply be the practice of meditating on the symbol of a working tool with a given standard of knowledge and how you would apply that to your life. Much like a lost secret, esoteric Freemasonry cannot be defined or communicated because it's going to be different for every man. It exists because from time immemorial, we have been in search of that which was lost or perhaps that which has only been forgotten in our collective unconscious. For some, it is gnosis. For others, it is philosophy. For still others, a fraternity and being bound to something that's simply much bigger than you are. For many men, the last example is esoteric enough for them. So I ask again, how do we integrate this into the structure of the craft? Well, perhaps, perhaps we don't. Since it has always been here and indeed already found a home in and outside of the craft, maybe instead of being integrated, we need to think about it being respected which brings me to my final points. An important lesson I learned early when I started giving papers and talks is to know your audience. To illustrate this, remember that Freemasonry brings all sorts of men to the table. Everyone has something to offer. There is room here for all. I know many men who are good, honest, upright, moral men, true pillars of the community in every respect. Some are even war heroes or first responders who risk their lives on a daily basis. Now, most of the ones I know would not do well with a detailed talk on the Kabbalistic tree of life. But my answer to that is, so what? That doesn't mean that they're not allowed to take part in my experience or me and theirs when it comes to the craft. As an esoterically minded Mason, I don't care. I feel honored and humbled to even be associated men, with men of this caliber. And if they are able to glimpse something of my experience, who knows? Maybe they'll be able to gain some sort of personal insight from it. Likewise, I've learned much from them simply by listening to them about honor, integrity, and what it means to be a man. So all you would-be occultists, mystics, sages, and seers, remember, 
It is usually this type of community and social aspect that builds the magnificent temples and buildings that you're able to meet in. You probably didn't pay the bills. You didn't build the temples. If a lodge was composed of strictly esotericists, and this is speaking from experience, chances are you wouldn't even be able to pay the electric bill. So to all the mystics out there, please be willing. Pitch in on a cleanup day. Work the gates of the county fair. Help raise funds for the lodge. Take part in the occasional ham breakfast. It will not kill you, I promise. The friendships you make and the bonds you form will indeed play a part in your spiritual growth. Make no mistake about it. You don't have to make these types of activities your exclusive level of involvement in the craft. On the other side of that coin, for the men who are not interested in such deep subjects, or at the very least, a more formal approach to our practices, do not stifle the men that are. Those who want to raise the bar or standards of their lodge or practice or delve deeper in spiritual make their own spiritual makeup. Not only is it unbrotherly, but it's wrong. Do not make Freemasonry so common that you have changed it rather than letting it change you. I've heard rank and file brothers all the way up to grand officers call both esoteric views and observant practices garbage, trash, a waste of time, and much worse things. Such behavior has no place in masonry. Putting on a suit and listening with an open mind to a talk on a deep spiritual subject isn't so bad. And as I just said, I can guarantee it will not kill you. You might just learn something, trust me. Epiphanies can come in lightning bolts on a mountaintop or in the still small whispers of one's own heart. There's a compromise that can be had, but likewise, there is a line or standard that should not be crossed. And so there it is, and here's the rub. We as Masons need to find that common point, that center of balance and equilibrium that will allow us all to drink from this well. As for what it will take to make that happen, I do not have the cure-all answer, but I do know from observing what others have done, my own successes and failures, both. This is not an easy answer, but the answer is there, provided we're all willing to at least take part and contribute to a greater effort. In the immortal words of Sting, we are spirits in a material world. We must find our balance in both for the sake of the craft. If we do not, then the craft will continue to turn into a husk or empty shell of what it once was and what it should be. Brothers, I thank you for your time. And I'd like to thank Lexington Lodge and the Rubicon Society for the honor of being allowed to speak here this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Worcester Brother. Excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, in just a moment, I'll go back to my screen here. So we are now open for discussion, and I'm hoping that uh, Worcester Brother Barry's presentation uh, brought a lot of questions to your mind, esoteric Freemasonry is a challenging topic to discuss for some and an easy topic to discuss for others, uh, as uh, Worship Brother, you said. So I'm, I'm going to start uh, and I want to get your take and opinion on a few things and hopefully that'll get sure. some comments rolling. Um, you mentioned Egregore of a Lodge. Yeah. For those that may not have heard that or aren't familiar with that term, would you would you dive into that a little bit and explain what that means? Sure. Egregore, um, an egregore is, is a, uh, it's a group mind. I think Young was the one who came up with the word. He, he might have even been the one who invented it. Um, it, it is a group mind of individuals uh, that are, you know, all engaged in the same pursuit. And an egregore can be built around any object of pursuit. I mean, an egregore can be built up in a PTA assembly. It can be built up in a lodge. It can be built up in a church. Or, or, you know, whatever group of people that it is. And, and the egregore tends, in spiritual circles, we think of the egregore of taking on a life of its own. It's fed, it can be starved, and it can do things that you may necessarily not want it to do. It can attract people, it can, it can eject people. Um, it, it, it really does take on a life of its own, and that's really the best way I know how to put it. it it's it is simply a, a group hive mind that uh, the sum of which is much greater than any of the individual participants. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
you didn't you didn't talk much about the term meditation in esoteric in your presentation here. It's I'm, yeah, it's it's a big part. <laughs> what, what would you yeah. say? Yeah, because I th I think a lot of brothers believe that and then use that, utilize that as a tool. Just would be curious to get your thoughts on that. Um, Jeff Bryant, uh, is he still on this call? There it is. Jeff was the one that really got me. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have just said his name out loud like that. I'm sorry, Jeff, for outing you like that. Jeff, Jeff taught me some basic principles many, many years ago on meditation. And I, I think without um, meditation, I mean, it, it, meditation is a practice, you know, and one, one thing that separates, you know, what we're, we traditionally call esoteric Freemasonry is, is, you know, we evolve from operative to speculative, but esoteric Freemasonry turns back into operative again. Uh, it's, it's cyclic, you know, so, and, and the practice of, you know, many of the things I listed, uh, one of the first, foremost, and most basic, of course, is meditation. And, um, you know, to, to focus on, you know, whatever it is that you're focusing on. Um, I know one of the things that Jeff told me when I mean, it's been years ago was, you know, when you are meditate, you know, all sorts of things, you know, will come at you at once, especially when you first begin and, you feel obligated to fight these things off so you can clear your mind. And, you know, he, he said, just let them come, you know, they'll, they're going to go away and learning how to do that to me is an integral part of the craft, but you know, that's, that's why it's tricky and it's touchy because it's not, um, it, it is not a, a considered a, a practice. So there is not a, um, we don't have a set of, uh, uh, practices that we give to initiates you know it's not an it's not a formalized part of it so i mean that, that's um i always thought that was kind of uh, it's kind of always implied that this is there but we don't have a you know a, a syllabus of, of activities or practices that we give you know to to new initiates or even you know advanced brothers on how to do this or you know what should you meditate on how do you meditate you know those sorts of things right um, Jeff, uh, Jeff Bryant, you were called out. Would you like to respond? I was. <laughs> Sorry about that, Jeff. That's, that's, that's quite all right. <laughs> Forgive me, brother. <laughs> You're not supposed to out anybody on anything. I forgot about that. I, I think it was a compliment. I think <laughs> it. it was. He's my Yoda. Jeff, do you want to add anything to that comment, to that topic? Uh, I mean, I've meditated for as long as I've been a Mason. Um, I started with practice of transcendental meditation taught by the Maharishi himself um, many, many years ago, but it's mainly just uh, focusing and quieting the mind, uh, which allows the the self to be more. I know that's sort of uh, a little, little too guru for most people, but uh, it's just something that I've learned to do. And to me, it's, it's as natural as taking a nap. Um, and it, it just helps clarify things and keeps me grounded. Sure. Thank you. So um, I have a really, really important question because I think a lot of the outside world might be thinking this. With esoteric Freemasonry, Barry, do you have any special powers? <laughs> I can't tell you that. <laughs> You know, it, it's funny, we, we get it and we're kind of laughing, but there are people that think this. And I think it's important to squash that on this presentation because we can't shoot laser beams out of our eyes. And no, 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 it's not, it's not about that, no. But there are people that think these things. So maybe just respond to those that might have that thought. Okay. That's, well, I, I kind of touched on that a little bit. I, to me, yeah. those going, the charlatans go into um, those kind of promises I, I, I don't have any problem throwing them into the same bucket as the spiritists or the, you know, the seances that I showed the slide of back in the day, because those, that to me is one of the lowest forms of uh, depredation that a human being can, can do on another. And, you know, taking, you know, promises of a spiritual something um, for usually money or power um, and nothing else, you know, temporal uh, things that they want. And um, I watch I watch mediums, um, you know, supposedly contacting dead relatives for for people that are just, you know, 
emotionally torn to shreds and it just it just really really burns me up i can't Mm -hmm. i can't stand to watch that sort of thing and that that's you know the in my experience the true spiritual orders we don't we don't take part in any of of, of that kind of stuff there's there's none of that uh, charlatanism that goes on but you've got to be able to discern uh, those groups because they are out there and sometimes they they put on a square and compass unfortunately um it is it is true um you just got to be able to discern and uh, separate the wheat from the chaff and the wolf from the sheep good point good point well said thank you uh, if anyone has any questions or comments, the best way to do so is to uh, raise your hand virtually. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff said he's seen me make food disappear. That's true. Yeah. I can make food disappear. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's magic. That's pretty good. That is magic. <laughs> um, see, even Most in- of us have that ability. <laughs> yeah, I guess we do. <laughs> um. I do see a couple of hands raised and I will call on you momentarily. And if anyone else has questions, you can write them in the chat. The best if you would be comfortable raising your hand and we can engage in discussion here. Uh, Troy, go ahead. Hi there, brethren. Uh, apologies, I won't share my video because my uh, internet connection won't support it. Um, no problem. I, I, I posted in the chat and I've been, I've been doing this for a while now. Um, p- perhaps... Um, the practice of esoteric Freemasonry would be better discussed as Freemasonry, because I, I don't, I don't think Freemasonry, based on its academic definition and is now studied academically for the past thirty years, um, I don't think Freemasonry is anything but esoteric. Certainly, there is an ex- exoteric aspect of Freemasonry, but all of the core tenets of the craft are meant to be uh, inculcated in an esoteric fashion. And, and contemplated in an esoteric fashion. And maybe we discuss it you know, amongst ourselves, but it's still behind closed doors. And, and anything that anyone who would recognize as Freemasonry is intrinsically esoteric. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't understand why we have to define it as esoteric Freemasonry, because it, to me, it's just Freemasonry. Yeah. Am I wrong yeah. in that? I, no, that's kind of, kind of one of the points I made that it, to me, by definition, it is, and it, it really doesn't matter if you view it that way or not. Um, like I said, the minute somebody took an operative working tool and turned it into a spiritual analogy, it was done. The, the die was already cast. So uh, to me, it's that's just the way it is. So as, as a follow up and just a discussion point, it, are there really jurisdictions uh, within our, our illustrious order that it were people who want to discuss, oh, I don't know, meditation on the working tools or an application of any of our obligations or messages or lectures to one's life? Are there really jurisdictions where that is considered some sort of uh, devil worship? Well, I have heard, yes, yes, there is. I'll just say that I have heard, uh, like I said, I've heard rank and file masons all the way up to Grand Lodge officers call even the interest in this kind of stuff garbage, trash, and far worse things. And and I, I think it's, uh, it's 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 like everything else. It probably depends on where you're at and what the severity is. Um, and but I'm I'm trying to think through my head, and I, I I'm thinking of the number keeps ticking up of brothers who who told me. You know, they get uh, ostracized from the lodge or grand lodge because they they have this interest or they talk about these things or want to talk about these things. Well, I think I think those of us who are at least minimally open to it would outnumber the rest, and we just need to be more vocal. And that that kind of drives me bananas. As as an organizer for the esotericism and Freemasonry conference, we've been doing it in the Northwest here the last four years. I've, I've seen no significant blowback or any complaints or I've had a little bit of pushback on the local content here at events I've organized where people are like, well, it's just, it's, it's, it's too airy fairy. It's too much esotericism. It's like, well, that's, that's what the attendees are begging for. So that's, we're providing what the market is asking for. Anyway, I just, I, I've, I've heard this before and I'm always 
I always got to sit down and just like check myself before I start being angry because it just being angry doesn't it's, make anything better. Yeah, <laughs> not, not no. you, brother, the great presentation. We, we, we thank you. Uh, we've all been angry for over 150 years, as I pointed out in that quote. Um, that I think that was just an allegory for you know something that was going on, you know, in the Masonic circles at that time. Uh, thank you, Troy. I appreciate your comments very much. Um, you know, my, my initial comments might be it's probably not much different than using the term heritage observance or traditional Freemason. That, that's, it, that's I, I agree with you, Brian. They, these two are tied. They're not necessarily the same thing because not every not every brother, and this has just you know been my experience, not every brother interested in observant masonry or the TO movement or those types of things is necessarily interested in deep esotericism. Um, and I mean the deepest, you know, when you start getting into meditation and Kabbalah and, and all that stuff. Um, but most, the vast majority of the, the brothers that I know do have those interests would rather have it tied to a TO type of, of observance of it. You, you know what I mean? Um, so it may not exactly, you know, those, those may not cross pollinate a hundred percent, but they are very, very closely tied. And, and I agree with you. It is, um, you know, like I said, and, and again, I, I said it in the paper, you know, the, the TO movement along with esoteric thought has been called a lot of names by a lot of people. Um, and it, it has no place in the craft, you know, that, that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, worship brother, uh, Piercy Jantz. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have a query on one of the slides, the, the slide you had with working tools. Are those the working tools from a particular jurisdiction? There, I noticed that there, uh, there's no trowel. I'll, I will tell you, sir, I, I, that came from just a regular Google search. I, have, I, don't, I don't really even know where those images came from. Okay. It, was, it was just a general Google search on working tools. Uh, that's what I thought you might say, but it was worth a query. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Okay, thank you. Brother Bruce. Brother Barry, uh, nice presentation. And uh, last Thursday, I think it was, the Ohio Lodge of Research had an online meeting, uh, which they're evidently doing every other month uh, during the year or something. But uh, during the presentation, a uh, gentleman, a brother from Connecticut Grand Lodge area was talking and he brought up something that had been mentioned, I think last month in our presentation here, which is the Chamber of Reflection. And I'm wondering if, because at least in my experience, we seem, I, that was the first time I ever heard about the Chamber of Reflection in those two meetings. And I'm wondering if because lodges have maybe done away with that, is that why we don't seek that deeper level and, and seeking the deeper meanings of life? The, the Chamber of Reflection, I, my understanding, and I, I've, I've not made a detailed study of the history of its use, but I thought the Chamber of Reflection um, was more tied to continental Freemasonry. Um, and if anybody knows different, please chime in and correctly, correct me. I, I thought it was more tied to, to continental style Freemasonry like the Rip Modern or the, the Scottish Rite Craft Degrees. And that's that's one of the reasons I said the Scottish Rite, for example, as, as we work in the United States today, is intensely underutilized because these things, um, I mean, it starts with a chamber, you know, and again, I can't get too specific because the audience here, but the chamber of reflection is meant to elicit a response from an, an initiate. I'll just leave it at that. Um, it, it is specifically designed to do so. And if you go in with an open mind, you can't walk out of that room and not have that experience. Um, and, and that's why I think rights like the Scottish right that do not work, you know, the first three degrees in this country, we we're really, really, really selling ourselves short because that, you know, again, I think that's why General Pike called it the, the foundation of that right. You know, that those first initial experiences 
or what make you that initian and get that get those gears cranking. Um, I, again, I, I don't know for sure if that was ever if it was done away with or if it was ever utilized at all in the web Preston work that we typically do in the United States. If uh, does anybody else have they made a detailed study of this to to know for sure? I'll ask that just as an open question. For me, I, I, I don't know, uh, but I always thought that uh, the Chamber of Reflection was more tied to continental uh, craft degrees. Uh, again, like the Rip Madern, the Scottish Rite, and uh, you know the Rectified Rite, and all the, you know all the other ones. They work in uh, on the continent. Yeah, I, I, sorry, brethren, to bust in, but I can make a comment on that. That that you are correct. The the. Um, Brother Easton, the Chamber of Reflection is specifically Scottish Rite uh, from its continental roots. And uh, in some jurisdictions, you're welcome to practice it as long as you don't call it a Chamber of Reflection. Yeah, yeah. And that seems to be the, 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 best, the best way to avoid any um, uh, uh, interference from ritual committees and whatnot. If you're interested in using that, um, D don't include it as part of the ritual it's it happens before and call it a preparation room or some such there's there's, there's ways of getting around a lot of things <laughs> well, and that's um I, I i i've been specifically told in no uncertain terms am i to call it a chamber of reflection yeah. so um it, it's a preparation room and um it, no hazing is required uh to have an effective use of the preparation room in my opinion yeah. absolutely I think that's the problem with at least my experience is that too many times people are talking to the candidate, uh, other things are going on, you know, it's not trying to get him really prepared mentally, we're only getting him prepared physically with the garb that is needed and the things that are needed and divesting him of certain objects and that and not really getting him thinking about what he's about to enter upon as he begins his journey. And to me, that seems like, you know, now that I'm further down the road, uh, having joined Freemasonry in a one day class, which I know is not really the way to uh, do it, but I'm in Ohio, what can I say? We do things a little different, but, um, you know, I, I keep reflecting and some of the stuff that you quoted from uh, Brother Pike hit home with me because last month we did a FC degree and at one point two of the brothers and I won't say exactly who but it was during the middle of the lecture or the beginning of the lecture and I could hear them playing this day. Well, I could hear them talking and it just, it led to a lot of confusion going on. And at one point the lecturer had to stop and get his thoughts back in order. And to me, that did a disrespect to the candidate for, you know, what was going on. You know, their attention was not on the candidate, but upon whatever they were discussing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, thank you brother bruce thank you uh, brother troy i just want to make a comment and clarification on, a, on, something, on something that you said so that way all of our listeners who might come across this will will know that you said hazing is not required hazing is not anything to do with freemasonry it should never be anything to do with freemasonry i don't believe you meant it in that fashion at all but I think it's important that we clarify for other viewers that that is not any part or should not be any part of Freemasonry ever. Yeah, the reason I bring it up is because it, it seems like uh, in some lodges, I've been part of the discussion where they're talking about doing it, uh, using a preparation room uh, and having some contemplative time before that. And, it, and it, it almost seems like a hazing. And it's like, no, it's much more effective if it's not. Um, uh, you know, uh, joking about what we do, I, I think there's room for it because it does provide a little levity. Uh, but with the new candidate, I, I prefer to take things much more seriously. 
and just you know there's there's not much more needed than just a quiet space um, and, a, and a minimal approach uh, but it, it does seem to provide some some oomph uh, especially uh, before a, a, the, the first degree in my opinion uh, Worship Brother John Cameron, go ahead. Thank you, uh, uh, Brother Evans. Uh, uh, just a, a comment and an observation. The, the, the uh, Chamber of Reflection is an indispensable part of, of Freemasonry, and it's a tra tradition we've lost, and I believe primarily because of the time involved to, uh, to conduct a proper Chamber of Reflection. Most lodges, at least in my jurisdiction, are putting through four, five, six uh, initiates uh, uh, per degree. And to undertake a chamber of reflection and have, um, have the candidate fill out uh, a piece of paper answering uh, four questions, uh, contemplate his answer to those questions. It, it takes uh, 10, uh, 12 minutes at least. Um, and if you have five people, there's an hour. So um, this is another uh, another example where time uh, has taken away from quality, at least in my opinion. We, I, I'm familiar with it both in the Scottish Rite and in the Blue Lodge. Uh, it has been done, but it's stopped just because of time. Thank you, brother. Brother, there's another uh, consideration on the reflection room is that while there's not a lot of documentation that they were ever used excessively in colonial or early lodges, some of the New England lodges did have them, but they didn't have them to the extent that the European lodges had created them, nor have they had been evolved into South America and certainly Mexico and the influence later in that and the influence from Louisiana on the reflection room that came from France the period of 1820 to roughly 1850 was a complete reversal of anti of Masonic sentiment in this country. And that was the anti-Masonic movement. It, it didn't take the kidnapping of William Morgan to create that. He just was a fuel on the fire. By the time Freemasonry dwindled to virtually nothing, many of the things that had been poorly explained to Masons were not defended, were not explained to those who had challenges of Masons during that anti-Masonic period. And those who challenged it didn't have anybody in Masonry to fully explain why the chamber was ever used and what it had to do with Masonry. As soon as Masonry got back on its feet, which wasn't really until the late, late 40s, 1840s, and the uh, a uh, decade before the Civil War, as it started climbing back, these things were forgotten. Most of the people who had ever heard of them in the in the jurisdictions that anti-Masonic cinema had affected had passed away, had left the craft. There wasn't a lot of institutional knowledge left. So those kind of things were the first thing to go. And there'll probably never be any true documentation as to how extensive it was ever used in these early lodges in America, but we know it was used. To what extent and how they were set up, it's very difficult to say. Thank you, Worsh Brother Gazak. Any comments uh, on that from anyone or questions? You know, um, so I think we probably can all understand and agree that Freemasonry and esoteric Freemasonry are, should be and are one and the same. Uh, I'm gonna just give maybe an, a, a, uh, an example of how one might consider thinking of it in, in extreme simple terms. Uh, ultimately, the goal is for each one of us to connect ourselves uh, and have a deeper understanding of ourselves internally um, and also with and through God. And I think esoteric Freemasonry, for those that wanna separate the definition, um, if you're, if you're traveling cross country, there's two ways to get there. There's the direct route, and then there's the scenic route. Some people like to take the scenic route, but we're all going and wanting to get to the same destination ultimately. Uh, and oftentimes, 
I think it can even depend on the mood that we're in, on what route we might decide to take someday. Uh, and also our age, our wisdom, our, our experience, our knowledge can all determine what route we take as well. So perhaps that may or may not be a, a good example to refer to this. Worship Brother Barry, I'll let you comment, but I think that might be a very simple way to think about it. Now you're muted, brother. Yep, sorry. No, I agree completely. Um, I just, you know, the point I wanted to try to make uh, with all this is that we, we've all we've all partaken of it and we've all reiterated the same thing here, you know, a couple different times tonight. Um, we, we take part in an esoteric society. It is up to you. I don't, I'm not going to use the phrase, you know, you put into it what you get out of it, but it's up to you to decide how far down you want to go. Okay. And there's some very, um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, I mean, there's some very uncomfortable places you can get into. Um, a lot of a lot of people that you know have these same interests as me. You know, we've we've come to the realization that um, if, if you're on this kind of path and, and interested in these kind of spiritual pursuits, it's not it's not butterflies and rainbows all the time. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. And and if it is sunshine and rainbows, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, I'm I'm a firm believer that any time any man or woman takes a step in the right direction, the gates of hell open up against them and try to stop them. And I think that's just the way of things. But, you know, iron sharpens iron. And uh, these things are meant uh, to help us along that path. Um, but we have to, you know, again, we can't make this just such a common thing. You know, the old adage, don't throw your pearls before the swine. Uh, people forget the second part to that. You know, don't throw your pearls before the swine. You know, you don't want a, a holy thing or a sacred thing trampled and, or made common, you know, in, in our modern parlance. But the second part of that quote that they never uh, rarely gets finished is if you throw your pearls before the swine, they'll turn on you and they'll rend you. And so not only have you made this a common thing, now it, they're going to turn on you and rend you. And, and that's that's the end result of that, too. I mean, look at what we've done throughout humanity to the people who tried to save us. You know, our history is written in blood, in the, in the blood of those martyrs, all of them, whoever they were. Uh, uh, but we have to, you know, as long as we know that we recognize that we're ready for it. Um, nothing, nothing of any value is going to come easily or cheaply. Um, the, these things come at a cost. You know, we lay, we lay things on the altar to, to ourselves and to God and to others unnamed. You know, we, we, we have to make these sacrifices because it's not, it's, you know, that, that resistance is what gives us strength. So, um, and again, all of these pursuits and, and, and even the craft itself, like I said, just within the, degree, the degrees as we work them, you've got a lifetime of philosophizing right there. I mean, there's no, it's not necessary to go anywhere else to look for anything else to uh, morally uh, philosophize on if you don't want. But if you do, you know, there are other outlets mm -hmm. and uh, we need to recognize that with each other, within the craft, without the craft and learn that, uh, uh, learn that we have things to learn off of each other, regardless of what our stripes are. So there's there's room at the table for everybody. Completely agree. Great comments. Firmly agree in uh, everything you just said. Uh, I would like to get some thoughts for maybe a few. So if I call on you, I uh, would appreciate your comments. Um, Worship Brother Rich Hansen, would love to get your take on tonight's presentation. Hey, well, good to be here. Um, I think it was a fantastic presentation. Barry, you've done a wonderful job. Uh, you know, esoterics is, is a, lays very close to my heart. Um, I think, you know, Freemasonry is, is just like the, the onion. You know, there's, there's several veils to go through, several layers to peel away. I mean, everything within our craft alludes to that. And that's, that's been one of the gripes of mine is you know where are these teachings and of course we go on those self journeys and maybe that's the way it's supposed to be maybe that is part of the journey but it should never be left out of or discredited like brother barry said because i've heard it too uh we're known as the ones who drink the kool-aid so <laughs> but you know that that's part of it that and, and i had to understand as 
a person that everybody is not on the same page of the book. Not everybody's on the same journey. And we are all one, though. And I, I respect the social aspect, the historical aspect, but I also noticed that there seems to be a spiritual aspect of masonry. And that's what attracted me. You know, I come from a Christian background and I was reading the Bible one evening and as a young man, and I, I realized that there was a book of Jasher mentioned and a book of Enoch mentioned. And I, you know, I was blown away. I was like, whoa, that's not part of the 66 books of the Bible. So there's always more. And there's, there's tons of symbolism in everything we do. And I think by not learning that or not wanting to learn that is just leaving another door of our temple closed. And that makes no sense to me because some, some form or fashion, we're all treasure hunters here, right? I couldn't imagine searching for the treasure within and never opening those doors. So brother Barry, it's wonderful, man. Wonderful. I hope there's more of this stuff coming forward. Uh, I love it. So thank, thank you. you. Society. Appreciate it. Great comments. Thank you for your comments, Worship Brother Rich. Are there any other questions or comments tonight for our presenter for this topic? I mean, he's good, but he's not that good. He can't be that good. He didn't cover it all. It's not, <laughs> no, I didn't cover it all, and I'm not that good. Uh, yes, you did a great job. Uh, we have someone with their hand raised, and I'll be happy to call on you, but I need you to identify yourself in the chat box for me first, please. Uh, Worship Brother Kimball, do you have any thoughts or comments tonight? Thank you, Worship Brother Brian. Worship Brother Barry, that was a, an outstanding presentation, and I, I compliment you heartily on that. I um, couldn't agree more that uh, the, the phrases Freemasonry and esoteric Freemasonry are exactly the same. Um, uh, it, it occurs to me that there is an underlying presumption in Freemasonry that the men in Freemasonry both have the ability and the desire to improve themselves by seeking more light. That Freemasonry is not a passive enterprise and it requires our active and diligent search once we uh, are admitted in to the ranks of Freemasonry. Uh, it, it's my impression that the vast majority of Freemasons don't know what Freemasonry is. Uh, that vast majority elects our leadership and our leaders don't know what Freemasonry is. And the resistance that we get to esotericism, which is really just the practice of Freemasonry, stems from the fact that we're populated and governed by men who don't know who or what we are. And until we change that culture, uh, we're going to continue to face that kind of resistance. Um, my willingness to compromise on that point has become less over the years. Uh, but if you, can, if you can find a point of compromise, share it with us. said thank you Mr. Brown. Um, we've discovered and i've discovered who the the lone hand is up there uh it's darren gullah what's your, our brother gullah do you have some comments you'd like to make tonight yes worship brother and i hate that i have to follow up worship brother dan kimmel there but can you hear me by the way i mean i'm walking home from the gym i'm walking home from the gym and can you hear me though I mean, very good oh yeah we can, well, awesome. we can hear you <laughs> Awesome. Well, I, I do want to thank uh, Worshipful Brother um, Eastman there for a wonderful discussion. And, and Worshipful Brother Rich, actually, is, I'm kind of piggy, piggybacking a little bit on what he said. Uh, I remember specifically reading some William uh, Wilmhurst, his Mania Masonry, and he says, look, there's two ways of looking at Freemasonry. There is the, the flat out, straight up moral, act like a good human being version and then there's a higher realm and i think bro worship brother eastman i think you captured that very well is like they're one in the same in my opinion but uh, and i'm also reminded a little bit about uh, there's a wonderful uh, you know theologian and early christian uh, historian elaine pagel she's up at, at princeton and she has a, a wonderful book uh, and it's very accessible it's, it's fairly short called the uh, gnostic paul and it says the same thing it's like they're you can read 
Paul, not to get into too much religion here, I'm of course not going to talk about any uh, theological matters, but you can read Paul as a psychic, someone who might interpret moral lessons, or you can read it as a pneumatic who wants to understand higher meanings of, of Jesus' teaching. And I think, I think Freemasonry is very similar to that. And that um, it doesn't make you a bad Freemason if you don't think about these higher level issues, but I don't think it makes you a fulfilled Freemason. And if you want to practice our craft the way it was designed, I think you have to understand that they're there and belittling them is not really a, uh, doesn't benefit anybody. So I hope that makes sense. And um, brother, worshipful brother Eastman, I'd love to hear your, uh, your take on that. So I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself here. Thank you, brother. Uh, thank you for the comments. I, I absolutely do agree. I, I, like I said a minute ago, there's room for everybody at the table. And um, I, I've, I said, I, said a little something earlier i said know your audience I'll, I'll tell you i'll give you a little hint of where that came from I, I don't know if anybody has ever been asked to leave a lodge show of hands i have i was giving a talk one night and it just did not um didn't go well i didn't know my audience and i was trying to talk um talk about you know the degrees and the completion of the degrees and everything and i was all but asked to leave that night it was very uncomfortable but that notwithstanding it Going back to the egregore again, you know, that egregore of the lodge didn't want to hear what I had to say. But that, in my mind, again, I'm, I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, so what? You know, I'm sure this that lodge does what it needs to do for those men, and that's fine. I have no problem with that. It was extremely uncomfortable for me that evening, and for the worshipful master, who was, who was a close friend of mine. He was, he was very embarrassed. Um, but it is what it is, uh, uh, but in my opinion, there is still room for everybody at the table. Uh, if if Freemasonry can can guide a man to the highest spiritual heights, you know that that's great. Or if it can just take another guy and it makes him, you know, he he gives up a gambling habit or or some other vice, you know, uh, you know, starts treating his wife better or whatever it is, you know, it's the little things, you know, it's it, it's going to be something different for everybody. And I have no, I have no qualms about any of it. So long as we all know how to get, get along together and know that we're a part of something greater than we are and that we're all going to the same goal. You know, we just, we're looking at the elephant from different angles. So we all have a different viewpoint. Yeah, well said. Uh, Reed Fanning. Brother Barry, I just wanted to say that I thought that was an absolutely fantastic presentation. Uh, I very much enjoyed listening to it on my ride home from a uh, regional Masonic conference. And uh, maybe if I'm lucky one day, you'll uh, be able to uh, deliver it again uh, in a setting for me. Thank but, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. I thought you knocked it out of the park. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Honestly, in, Freem in Freemasonry, anything that's belittling to others, or, or um, I mean, we can all agree to disagree at many times, but belittling others or doing anything that creates disharmony in a lodge or in our fraternity is unacceptable. Uh, Jeff, Brian, you have some more comments? Go ahead. I just have one last comment. I, uh, a friend of mine, a friend of mine and Barry's, uh, taught me one time a very important lesson, and I think it applies to esoteric Freemasonry. And it was uh, how Jesus' parables, most churches believe that Jesus' parables are there to help lay people understand Jesus' deep meanings. But just the opposite is true, because Jesus told his disciples, it is not given for them to understand. You know, basically, let him who has ears to hear, hear and understand. So yeah, Freemasonry has place for those who don't can hear and understand, but it also has deeper meanings hidden in there for those who that who can hear and understand. Thank you. Uh, Worship Brother Poe, I'd love to get your thoughts. True. On that. I'll, I'll follow up with that one. 
Go ahead, Brother Barry, you follow up on that. I was just going to give one quick follow-up to that. There was a, uh, a book called Zanoni written by Edward Bulwer Delighton, and he gives a quote about, uh, uh, about something along those lines, and he, he talks about equality. And, and, you know, men are created equal, um, and this, this, is, this sounds rough, uh, but I realize it does, but men are not equal, um, and it, it's, it's the nature of things. You know, the sun, when it rises, hits the mountaintops before it hits the valleys. And if we went through each succeeding generation with no man wiser than any other, nobody to teach us, um, uh, nobody to teach us, you know, better and higher things, it'd be a terrible state that we were in. Um, and and it, I think I think Leighton had, uh, had some specific things in mind when he wrote that passage, but I just wanted to throw that in there that popped in my head. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Worship Brother Poe, do you have any comments tonight? Having audio difficulty. <laughs> well, that's a first. We'll take that as um, as congratulations uh, and well and good presentation. All right, well, uh, Worship Brother Martin, any thoughts that you have might tonight that you might want to share? Uh, well, first, uh, Worshipful Brother uh, Barry, uh, outstanding presentation. Uh, I had several thoughts while you were speaking and in my journey of Freemason, you know, it's the esoteric side of Freemasonry that really gets my attention and motivates me to want to want to explore and and learn new concepts that are outside just the what I would term and probably ill term the traditional teachings of Freemasonry. Uh, it seems like uh, just about every uh, publication I pick up um, points to the esoteric nature of Freemasonry, whether it be the alchemical keys to Masonic ritual uh, by Timothy Hogan, uh, the approach uh, approaching the middle chamber that just came out this year by Jamie Paul, uh, the seven liberal arts in Freemasonry and the Western esoteric uh, tradition. Uh, everything uh, that I read that uh, has uh, esotericism in it motivates me to want to learn more about Freemasonry. Um, so um, those things popped into my mind when you were speaking and it was an outstanding presentation. Thank you, Worship Brother. Brother Barry, you want to respond? No, no, I just, I just wanted to say thanks. All right. <clears throat> We are going to proceed on with the evening. Uh, brothers, next month's presentation will be delivered by the most worst brother, Robert G. Davis, who is the author of The Mason's Words and master of the Grand Lodge of Oklahoma. Um, this presentation will be delivered on uh, August 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern. We encourage your attendance and look forward to having you join us. Instructions for this meeting will be sent out to everyone Monday morning uh, of this meeting. And if you know of anyone that might have an interest in participating or joining us, please invite them to RSVP at RubiconMasonicSociety.com slash RSVP. And lastly, I would just like to open the floor first to any, any participants that would like to make any final comments, for Brother Barry, and then uh, we'll proceed with Worship Brother Bizak, Worship Brother Kimball for any final comments. Barry, I'd like to applaud you for the even-handed overview that you've given tonight. That's very well done. And thanks for taking the time and, and, and sharing what those of us who know you know you've always stood for in our fraternity. Well done. Thank you. Worship Brother Kimball, do you have any final thoughts tonight? Well, echo uh, Worshipful Brother Bizek's uh, remarks uh, this is, uh, uh, in my opinion, one of the best uh, presentations and discussions that we've had. And Worshipful Brother Barry, I thank you for that. Thank you. Indeed. Worshipful Brother Barry, thank you, sir. I look forward to seeing you at the next uh, next get-together. I thank you. I look very much forward to it. Appreciate everything that you have done and do for Freemason. It, uh, it's, it's, it's great to know you. Thank you, brother. 
Worship Brother Kimball, will you please do the honors and deliver a closing devotion this evening? Brothers, let's pray. Great architect of the universe, we give you thanks for the time that we have had this evening to share our thoughts, to share our feelings about this wonderful gift of Freemasonry that you have given to us. We ask your blessings on every man and every lodge that are represented here. We ask your blessings in our fraternity. We pray that you would lead us to act as you would always have us to be. And we ask all this in your holy name. Amen. So mode it be. Mode it be. Brothers, again, thank you all for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, RSVP at Rubicon Masonic Society.com slash RSVP. Please keep all sick and distress in your prayers and always trust in God with all your heart. Thank you, brothers. Have a great evening.